Well, I'm going to jump us into our second article here. Um, and I'm, I'm afraid it doesn't have the same profound impact on people just yet. But let's let's jump into it and see what we're talking about here. You know, we we're talking about huge implications of mind controlled wheelchairs. Now let's let's get down really, really small. We're talking about bug robots, really, really small bug robots from MIT. Um, and uh, just some background. When it comes to robots, I, I say size matters. Um, and in terms of bug robots, bigger isn't always better, right? I mean, imagine uh, some of the applications you want to use uh, a swarm of insect-sized robots for. They talk about um, if we somehow have bees that go extinct. You want to go pollinate a field. You don't want things that are the size of an airplane flying around trying to pollinate a field. You know, bees are tiny for a reason. It's so that they can fit in the flowers without damaging it and go on and pollinate the next one. Um, and also searching rubble for survivors. So they want to make tiny little insect-type drones that can fly around uh, in the rubble of a collapsed building or something after an earthquake and look for survivors in there. Um, and in this case, size matters, but it's because smaller is better, not bigger. So I, you got my attention for sure, but I'm not sure if you know this, but you just explained the start of a Black Mirror episode. Like an actual Black Mirror episode. Yeah, yeah. I, so, I am aware of this. I'm interested to see where, where you're going to go with it, but I'm open. I'm open to it. Well, this team from MIT, their whole focus is on trying to make these bug robots come to life. And, you know, okay. there are, I'm not sure of what their eventual intentions are of it. I, I assume it's good. These are, you know, scientists trying to improve the world. I, I don't think they're going to, you know, create surveillance drones that are actually bees or bees that are actually surveillance drones. But, you know, when they talk about the shortage of bees that we might have, you know, we can't save our bees. We don't know exactly why they're dying. And we know that it is a key, their pollination, to agriculture that sustains life on Earth. Absolutely. So as a contingency plan, these guys are like, let's let's make some bug robots that are small enough that we can pollinate plants if we need to. Well, um, Sorry, real quick note. Some a fun fact I heard about just how crucial these bees are and how we're hurting as a result of their diminishing po population. There's actual like bee farmers, I guess, that have to truck out their bees from the east coast to the west coast during different periods of time to get the bees to pollinate because those regions don't have the bees they need anymore. Yeah, that's so we're like literally moving bees around the country to make our produce grow, grow that we depend on. And I can only imagine that will continue to get worse in the next few years so i'm hoping these bug robot folks and other scientists are working on this problem but what they're saying is traditional rigid actuators like we're talking like a motor with an axle those aren't durable enough at the small size that you need to make a flying bug robot to actually work over an extended period of time they're saying a traditional right. rigid actuator could only flap the wings of a bee for a few seconds before it dies out so what what's the solution here if you want to make something that small um they look at biology and that this is where the the bio inspired part of this engineering solution they've created artificial muscles that's that's the actuator that's powering these wings um it's just layered levels or layered uh slices of thin electrode and then elastic and they polarize the electrodes um one positive, one negative, and it tightens the elastic together. And that strain is used just like in a muscle when electrical impulses are applied to your muscle to tighten them um, to actuate the wings. So there's just pulses of electricity on and off is what's flapping the wing. And they have elastic layers in between those electrodes that's squishing. And that, that, that mechanical strain in that elastic is what's pulling the wing and flapping it. Got it. Um, just like a muscle, you know, the impulse is applied from your brain the electricity goes through your nerves to your muscles and that electricity there causes your muscles to tighten um that's what they're trying to do here but with really 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 small artificial muscles these one typically require really high voltages to operate that's challenging and they also the smaller they get the less reliable they get so imagine if you're trying to make something that's really thin you know, one piece of dust or one little bubble, that defect matters a lot as opposed to when you have a larger one. Um, that makes sense. That the electricity can pass through that or the elastic won't tear because of that. Um, so they basically reinvented the entire fabrication process for these artificial muscles, which for them, these are experts at MIT that have done this before, that have had research at the forefront. They made a six-layer muscle 
that, you know, was considered to be state of the art at the time. And they're saying that's still not good enough for us to make tiny robots. So they reinvented their entire fabrication process through a bunch, a bunch of trials to reduce the required voltage and to reduce the thickness of this thing so that it can be used in small, small applications. So I'm not going to go into everything that they did. If you want to check that out and you're a material science geek, like Forbode and I are, um, you can check out this up, ep- check out this article. It's going to be linked in the show notes, but this is going to sound like a lot of the stuff that we read about or did in our nanomaterials fabrication lab for about, um, they rehauled their spin coating process, their vacuum sealing process, the concentration wow. of carbon nanotubes in their electrode formula, their curing times in the oven, their curing times out of the oven, curing in a vacuum, curing outside of a vacuum. And they're doing all of this in a, in a clean room so that there's no dust Basically, it's like a trip down did. memory lane, dude. It, like, it is a trip down memory lane for us. And for folks that aren't involved with all these processes, you can basically say that they made this thing before that was state of the art. And then they put that on steroids and, you know, looked at every single part of their fabrication process, scrutinized all of it to reduce all the parts of error, to optimize every single step along the way. And so remember, I said they made a relatively thick six layer electrode that required a lot of electricity to operate. They created, this time, one that was thinner, but had 20 layers involved of alternating right. elastic and electrode, um, which is, you know, more like the muscle. The muscles are fibrous in our body. It's, it's made of layers. Um, and so they tested this against their previous state-of-the-art six-layer one, as well as the smallest and, you know, best and brightest state-of-the-art rigid actuators. Like, that's what I was talking about, motors and axles. Right. Um, and... They were, their results were they were able to make a robot that was 0.63 grams. That's one quarter the weight of a penny in the U.S. So think about how light and small this thing is. Um, the soft actuator robot, you know, when they installed their previous actuator muscle, it could barely fly. It could fly for a few seconds and kind of hover off the ground. This one could hover with extreme control. So they could tell it where to go and then it would hover there wow. in that position for over 20 seconds. And that's the longest flight ever by a robot under one gram. And that includes all type of actuators that have been created to date. So now what was, was the 20 second flight time constrained by the energy source or the actuator lifespan? It was constrained by the actuator lifespan. So there's Got more it. still that they need to dig into, um, to, 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 to figure this out. But basically what they figured out is a, I would say, a quantum leap in terms of getting something to function. I mean, imagine um, the difference between a tiny bug robot that, you know, looks like its wings are broken. It's basically flapping around and it can barely fly or it kind of hovers off the ground and it can't fly for an extended period of time versus something that can fly around for 20 seconds and you can have extreme control over it. I only imagine as they continue to dive deeper into this, they'll probably get something that can fly around for minutes and then they'll talk about hours. And, you know, this is just one step along the way. 20 seconds doesn't sound like a lot. But it is a lot compared to what they had before, which is something that could barely fly at all. It, it's those, you know, giant baby steps that get us to where we need to go. And this is one of those giant baby steps. Yeah, it's incredible. And, and also, one of the things we talk about is you know, when we're talking about drones and stuff like that, the, the weight is really, really important. The amount that it's able to lift in proportion to the weight of the robot or the drone itself. Um, and so I was thinking like, well, this one, if they've you know made it this light and they've made it this small and it's able to fly for 20 seconds, um, is it just not going to be able to fly at all when you add something on there, like an attachment to help it pollinate or a camera right. to help look for people in the rubble? They said that this... Or to spy thing, on people. This thing... <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> this thing can effectively lift things over three times its weight and still able to be able oh, to fly wow. under real control. So it's not like they're tapping out the lift to weight ratio of where this thing is, you know, this thing's potential. They still have a lot of room and three times the amount of weight to add on in packages and attachments and stuff if they want to um, before they reach what I would call like the, the physics limit of what they're trying to do. So the amount of lift that Maximum this thing is lift able off to generate capacity. versus the amount of weight that it's able to carry. Okay. And like, so like this, 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 uh, this feat of engineering is mainly for like these bug robots right now, right? Yeah, that that's their biggest focus. And but these the, actuators, they could be used for any application that requires high RPM, right? Exactly. And that that's actually what this team specializes in. As a, a some of the research here, um, the researchers they focus on small robotics. 
but most mm-hmm. of the team is actually focused on soft robotics, and that's them using the elastic actuators as opposed to a hard, rigid actuator. And they're saying, you know, this fundamental unlock of what we've done for bug robots, we can use this to create artificial muscles that are much stronger, require less power, and last a lot longer for all types of applications. So what they've really done, you know, I would call it the secret sauce of what they've developed here, is they from the ground up, remember they reinvented their part of the fabrication process, they found a way, you know, from the ground up to create a new artificial muscle that works a lot better than the ones that we've seen before, requires a lot less power, lasts a lot longer, and is also, you know, free of all the manufacturing defects that we've seen so far. Right. Wow. No, the, this, uh, I, I think you downplayed this article a little bit when you first started. This is really cool, dude. Yeah, well, this is a pretty I, big deal. I didn't mean to downplay it. I think w- what we were looking at before has a lot of immediate impact. And this bug robot here is like we're opening, and I wouldn't call it a can of worms. I'd call it like a can of awesomeness. Um, MIT just opened a can of off- awesomeness in terms of creating artificial muscles. And they're doing it for bug robots now. I'd love to see where they apply it in the future. And I'd also love to see them improve and iterate until they get to a point where you know, hopefully all of our produce isn't screwed if the if the bees die off and we, we have a way to pollinate the fields without killing all of our produce as well.